Hey there everyone, this is the Vintage Sewing Machine Garage taking advantage of some nice indirect light today and wanted to make a video for you all. Uh, I have been collecting, rescuing, purchasing and restoring vintage sewing machines for quite a few years now and so I'm, I'm used to sort of knowing what to look for in uh, sewing machines when I'm trying to check them out. For many of you, if, if you're like me, you don't always have the luxury of testing a sewing machine. Sometimes you will get a machine at a thrift store. You might or might not be able to see if it runs. It may have a tag on it that tells you, hey, it runs uh, or has been checked. Um, some of the thrift stores are good about actually you know, putting thread in them and checking them out. Other times you will get a machine and you will be told uh, by the seller that it runs and it might or might not or maybe they what they really mean is it ran the last time that it was used. Uh, there are other times when you may uh, buy this off of a place like Craigslist for example get it from someone locally and they might offer you the chance to try it out and you plug it in and the machine you know the needle goes up and down and you assume that it runs um, and other times you just never know. Uh, and, and I mention this because for some of you, you may be just getting ready to do this or maybe you are getting your very first vintage sewing machine and you're excited about it, you've gone online, you've researched, you've looked, <clears throat> whether it's videos like, you know, like this one or others, other places on the internet, and you've gone and you're like, man, I really want one of these Kenmore uh, 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 free arm machines because I've heard people like this vintage sewing machine garage guy talk about them and talk about how great they are and I just found one I can't believe it. it's it's one of the right numbers it was made in Japan it's all metal and this is gonna be a great machine and maybe I just need to clean it up a bit well I wanted to show you I'm gonna do uh, yet another series of videos on some of my adventures when I have gotten machines and Sometimes you, particularly if you're new at this, you may have gotten a sewing machine, uh, whether you're interested in restoring or maybe you just want a good sewing machine for yourself and you heard that the old ones were really good. Uh, and so you have gotten a machine and then you realize you've gotten into more than you bargained for and the machine's not running. And I'm showing you this to let you know that it, it can happen anytime you get a vintage machine. And there are times when you get a chance to check it out, and there are times when you don't. Uh, I'm going to be doing this, instead of trying to put all of the machines that I have gotten and this has happened, I'm going to do this in a series so that you can see the different experiences. This, what you are looking at, is, as many of you know, is one of my favorite machines. It is, I call it the last of the Mohicans. It is one of the last great heirloom quality all metal sewing machines ever made and it was made in the mid 1970s circa 74 75 and then I believe 76 was probably the last year uh, until they started substituting plastic gears in this brand other brands have different years where they where they switched over to the cheap side as I like to say so I have mentioned this machine briefly before I was talking to some of you about uh, the uh, tension disc, the upper tension uh, assembly as it's called. And I just kind of wanted to, to give you all a background on this and to let you know that uh, if this ever happens to you and you get a machine and it's in a lot worse shape than you thought, don't be discouraged. Uh, most machines can be brought back. Now I haven't literally gone through all of this machine yet and I'll I'll uh, keep all of you updated with videos to see how far I get. This machine was available for free. Uh, I think it had been listed for sale and nobody bought it. And finally, the, the person who posted it, available, it was online, and they said, this machine is free. Uh, please pick up by Wednesday or it goes in the trash. So I got in touch with them. I said, no, 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 I'll, I'll come get it. You know, don't, don't discard it. And I did, and I, I got the machine home, and I immediately knew that it was somebody had gone in. I suspect they were having problems with their thread tension, and they went and tried to uh, uh, adjust or investigate the tension assembly. And unfortunately, they, they disassembled it, and uh, I was left with uh, this, 
which is basically you will see you see a bobbin case, some bobbins, and uh, you will see the bobbin tension assembly or parts of it that were kept in a bag. So it was literally, this machine was covered under plastic, sitting outside, they said, pick up by so-and-so time. So I went and got it, and I wanted to show this to you specifically to, to encourage you, not only that you can rescue a machine, we'll see how this one turns out, but also to make sure that, uh, to paraphrase the old uh, medical, uh, uh, the famous quote that uh, the doctors have, first do no harm because you can actually damage the machine that you have just bought unwillingly not, uh, because you didn't know better and you were not sure what was going on with it. So I have, uh, I was excited, I got the machine, it came with the original manual, but I, you can always get one if you don't have that, but that's certainly nice to have. And as you can see, the manuals get thicker as you go through, by the time you get to the 70s, there's lots of different features in these machines. I've already ex explained to you there are parts, uh, some accessories, and the remains of this tension assembly that someone tried to fix. And it came with a nice Kenmore box. And in that box is the button holder, uh, button holder attachment, which is a nice little thing to have. And of course, it had its foot pedal. And the foot pedal appears to be in good shape. I haven't tested it yet, but the cord's in good shape. There's no punctures. There's no dry rotting. So again, I won't know until I until I test it. So, you might be asking yourself, well, why don't you plug it in and see if it runs? No, 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 no. That is not something you want to do. Now, if you have tested the machine, let's say you got it from someone, they demonstrated it for you, they explained that it runs good, you're still going to need to go through your machine, but at least you have an idea, you've seen it run. I never saw this machine run, and I intentionally did not plug it in and I did not try to run it and I'll explain why. So one of the things that happens to sewing machines often is that they sit. They sit for a really long time and this one has. Now one of the things that people often do is that they will they will get a hold of a machine like this and say well it's vintage it's all metal there should be no problem I can start taking the knobs and twisting them and turning them and these are very stiff. In fact, when I try to turn this, it's, it's not wanting to move. I'm not forcing it. Just literally, I should be able to move it, and it's very stiff. If that happens, uh, stop right there. Don't go any further, because this machine is all steel. Behind these little plastic knobs, it's okay that they're plastic, because they are attached with some sort of bonding adhesive or cement to metal. Okay, and that metal, uh, which is what these little plastic knobs are really just sitting on top of, that metal is connected to metal linkages inside. If these don't move, then there, that means that something is amiss inside, and chances are the machine is frozen. That doesn't mean it's going to be frozen forever. But if you take anything, any part of this machine, plastic or not, and you try to force it, you're like, oh, well, it just needs a little help you could end up damaging your own machine unnecessarily. You don't have to do that. And it's not a reflection on the quality of the machine. But remember, many of these machines have sat. And I, I'm going to theorize as to how this machine got in this condition. And I'm going to show you essentially what needs to happen, what I'm going to try to, to try to rescue it. So uh, let's start. I'll start with... This section here, and I, I'm trying to remember if I showed any of you, but this machine came, the, this is where your th uh, thread spool pins are, and you see pins here. Well, I had spares, and the Kenmores of this era use a spool pin that is, uh, it has threads on the end. I think that's going to come in there with, on the camera. And they often have a little place for a screwdriver on the top, and that's also very nice. Well, when I got this, you could see the stubs in each of these holes where I don't know how it happened or if the machine got hit in some way, but these pins were broken off. And so I took off the lid and then I went because they thread all the way through the lid to the other side and I was able to put a little bit of uh, 
it was either sewing machine oil or WD-40, and I was able to actually take pliers and pull the remnant of the little, the little threaded stub here through the hole, and then I was able to uh, take the replacements I had, and the threads were fine. And, and, and of course, I put a little drop of oil on there. You should always do that when you're, when you're screwing anything new into the machine. Now, uh, the, one of the first things you can try when, you're, when, you've, when you've got a machine, you have no idea, you, you really need to kind of diagnose it, right? Figure out what's, what's up with it. This is a power switch. Notice I do not have the machine plugged in and I'm not going to. I'm nowhere near ready to do that. So I take the hand wheel and like most hand wheels, it's designed to come toward you. Now I'm very gently and lightly I've got my fingers on it and I'm pushing and it's not moving. Guys, this thing is, it's like, it's like it's been cemented. Uh, now, what would happen if I plugged in the foot pedal and tried to turn this on? Uh, the electricity would go through and I could do several things. I could end up breaking a belt. More likely, I could end up straining the motor to a point where it would damage it or possibly even burn the motor out. And that would be a shame because the Kenmore motors from this period are excellent. They're 1.2 amp, they're very strong, they're very durable as a rule. So that's not something I want to do to my machine. So as you can see, this was free, but it's going to involve quite a lot of labor to get it to a place where it's gonna sew again. So I'm gonna let you guys kind of go with me on this journey because I wanted, you know, I'm always showing sewing machines to you folks that are restored. You've seen all the work I've done to them and I, and I show them sewing beautifully. But sometimes you get a machine and this is what you're getting. But, but don't despair because it is not a lost cause, not yet. In the, I'm going on nine years of doing this. I'm, I'm just under 200 machines that I've restored and only two machines have I ever had to give up on. And of course I kept them for salvage parts. I didn't discard them. But, uh, and, and who knows, one day I, I may do a video on why that happened and I'll give you examples of, of how to stay away from uh, machines that can cause that problem. But in any case, uh, this is one of the last great machines and I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it a shot and see if we can save it. Now, taking advantage of my, my light once again here. Okay, uh, so I immediately, you know, decided I'm going to uh, get this machine opened up to see what I can see. Well, the first thing I do is I pull open the side door. Now, when I look inside, I see something that I don't really like, which is, let's see if we can zoom in a little bit here for you guys. Bear with me, because I want to give you, you know, looking at grease in, in a compartment of a sewing machine takes a little bit of zooming here. Now, take a look right there. What you're looking at is not old sewing machine oil. This machine is not that old. What I see right here, it looks like someone has put something in here other than sewing machine oil and there's all kinds of information out there, people telling you you should use this, that, or the other. It looks like someone has put grease in here. There's only one place you ever use sewing machine grease, and that is on gears. You do not, you do not put it on any other uh, moving parts. If you do, you will gum them up because they're not designed to, to be lubricated with grease, they're designed to be lubricated with sewing machine oil. And right here, I even see uh, this is this is very sticky and gooey and uh, someone has clearly put the wrong lubricant in here. Now, is that alone enough to cause a machine to lock up? Probably not. What they did was they baked it. Uh, it is remarkable to me that uh, what, what can happen in the life of an old sewing machine. What often happens is the original purchasers and owners of these machine, machines, they knew how to take care of them. They knew how expensive they were when they were new. But what happens is a machine will get handed down or someone will get rid of it and give it to someone else. And that person may say, you know what, I'm gonna keep that machine, but I don't really have room for it. So they might put it down in a basement. 
where it can get um, uh, mildewed, it can get damp, exposed to moisture. Uh, sometimes they end up in a garage where they suffer both heat and moisture or up in an attic. I get the feeling this machine was stored either in a garage outdoors in the hot summer or in an attic space. And that is the perfect oven for baking in old lubricants and it really is one of the worst things you can do for a machine. Now the machine is not broken, but like the Tin Man in The Wizard of Oz, it is frozen. And I mean frozen good. How did I know this? Also, I, I was actually going to... Um, what was I doing? Uh, let's tilt the camera down for you guys. I was originally picking, trying to pick up the presser foot, which should slide right up. And when I did, it wouldn't budge. And I thought, oh, we've got some problems here. So what we have is old, uh, the wrong lubricant, and it is a mess. And again, I know what old sewing machine looks like. Sometimes it'll be a little yellow, but this deep, dark discoloration uh, on a 1970s machine, I can clearly tell that someone has squirted grease in here, and then the machine has um, sat for a long time, and I believe it, was, it got really warm, and, uh, and, and now we have a bit of a mess. So... Uh, this, of course, zoom back out. This, of course, is a uh, what is called a convertible machine or a free arm. They call it convertible because you, you can press a button and you can remove the lower section. But first, I'm going to make sure that the little door, aha, sure enough. Let's show you what happens. I went to remove this and I now was going to show you this, but now I'm going to show you because I did it. You'll notice that the section that removes or converts the machine from a flatbed to a free arm, this is a common problem that happens. Down here below, there's a door that is used to access the bobbin area. If it's left open, which people sometimes do, that's fine, but if you go to take this carriage off, you're going to end up uh, being blocked by that door, and you don't want to hurt the door or damage it. In fact, someone already has, but uh, it still has a good hinge on it, so it's, it'll be fine. But for the moment, we, we've removed that, <clears throat> we put that back up, and now I can pull this off. So, a great free arm machine to have. This was, this was Sears' attempt to have a machine that was the equal of Bernina, and I'll do another video sometime to, to challenge you all to see if you think it is. I actually think it's pretty darn competitive with Bernina in, in many ways. So, I'm going to now take a screwdriver. And by the way, by the time we get to the mid-70s, sewing machine manufacturers were no longer putting holes in the tops of the machines where you could oil them. You can still oil your machine, and in the manual it tells you how. Uh, these machines can be oiled, but not as easily. Even in the mid-70s, folks, they were already trying to make it more difficult for people to maintain their own machines. And, of course, the, 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 uh, the result is that people, well, you know, you could just bring it in and we'll service it for you. Nothing wrong with that, but, again, they were, they were starting to remove the, uh, you know, the, the customer's ability to, to, to take care of their own machine. Now, I'm going to show you this lid. This is... Let's angle this back up a little bit. This is a really important thing to note. When you are removing this lid, and there's a, there's a direction in the manual that tells you to take a screwdriver and do this, be careful because you've got moving parts here. It would be very easy to cause a problem with this. Now, I know that there's a spot right here up against the front of the machine. I'll get my knuckles out of the way. Let's see, there we go. See if that's any better. Here we go. So I'm going to come under here and I'm going to press up and when I do, it opens up the lid. And you can see, if I can get out of my own way here, two little places where uh, there are little uh, metal pins that these little clips fit on. They're, it's fairly easy to, to see. Now, take a look guys. If you look here, there's the bobbin winding tire, and look how shiny it is. That tells me somebody put grease on that. That is not a part that you grease. I can already tell I'm going to have to replace that or at the minimum clean it. Um, so somebody went to town in a way that ended up causing more problems than they saw. Now, 
Let's take a look and see what we can see inside here. Oh boy. Okay. I'm beginning to get a feeling I understand what happened. Take a look. I'm going to, I'm holding the machine, I'm going to try to zoom in without having everything all over the place. If you look closely, guys, I don't know if it's easy to pick up, but down in the bottom of this machine is a lot of grease. Uh, that's not oil. Somebody has squirted some kind of lubricant. I don't know what it is, some sort of grease of some sort. And, it, and combining that with putting this machine in a place it shouldn't be, such as an attic, they have literally frozen the machine up. They haven't broken it, but they've made it really impossible to turn. I mean, it's really locked. It'll move just a hair. Um, zoom back out. You know, I can just barely, now I can just, I can see I can just barely wiggle this, but I'm not going to do that. So, what do you do if you end, end up in this kind of situation? What do you do to rescue a machine that is, in my opinion, worth rescuing? Uh, we're going to see. We're going to take a look and see what we can figure out to save this old Kenmore because it's not just an old Kenmore. The vintage Kenmores are some of the best machines ever made, and this is an amazing machine. It has all kinds of decorative stitches built in. It was a crazy expensive machine when it was new, and it's all steel. It is, uh, I believe it is the rival, uh, a, a really strong competitor or rival to the Berninas of the same period. But right now, given the condition of this machine, we are going to, uh, I'm going to try something I rarely, if ever, have to do. I'm going to spray it down and try to get some of this old grease and oil off. Uh, and we've got to do it in a way where we don't harm the machine. We don't want any of that stuff near the motor. Uh, but this is a situation where uh, I'm going to have to, to uh, it's not, you know, Q-tips and, and a little alcohol is not going to cut it here. I'm going to have to go in and uh, put the machine in a spot where I can set it outside and I'm going to try to get some cleaner on it. I'll probably start with WD-40 and see what that will do and let it sit. So, you know, we're going to, we're going to do what we can uh, in order to save the machine. But as I mentioned to you before, if you ever get a machine this like this, in this kind of condition, don't force your knobs. You will break them, and, and it's not going to be the knobs' fault because they've survived this long since the 70s, and they're perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with this outer plastic piece because it's not normally a stress point when your metal parts are moving properly. So we're going to start there, and I'll uh, pick up with the video, and I'll show you uh, what, what my plan is for getting some of this old goop off. Okay guys, I took the machine outside and I put plastic down. Um, I do not want to do this indoors because I don't care for the smell of these types of products, but <clears throat> I'm going to go in and start trying to just put some of the WD-40 here. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm not trying to flood the machine, but notice I'm going to focus on areas where there's moving parts, places where parts can move, uh, metal parts moving against each other. Uh, let's see, maybe I should zoom in a little bit more for you guys. Maybe not that much. Hold on, let's see. There we go. So I'm going to do this in a way that I'm hoping will allow me to get, get some of that heavy grease dissolved, right? And I, again, I want to be careful. Down below here is my motor. I don't want any of this stuff in the motor. Most of the holes or openings in the motor are on the side. Nevertheless, you know, don't go crazy with it. You don't have to. It's where metal moves against metal. Now, down in here, if I turn this to the side, there are some metal. This is the metal that's behind those plastic knobs. Okay? So I want to get that because that's going to have to move again. And I just want to, you know, give it, give it the best shot that I can. And I'm not going to try to move it yet. Now let's come over on the side. We'll take a look at this Ugh. This is where the needle bar and the presser bar are, and I'm going to come in here and put some of the WD-40 in here, and again, I want to get it on those places that I know have got that old grease, which is slowing, slowing, it's basically freezing my machine here.
Now, I can always go back with more, but I'm going to try this and I'm going to let it sit. Remember, what, as I've said before, patience is your friend. Another place you don't want to go. This is where uh, one of, there are two belts on this machine, and one of them is sitting here, the other one is beneath it. Keep this stuff, keep anything, <laughs> whether it's lubricants or cleaners or W, don't put anything on your belt and keep that stuff away from the motor. So I'm going to leave this outside and we're going to see how it does. I'm going to let it sit. I'll let it sit for a day, maybe two. Uh, I'm going to put it inside this plastic to cover it. Uh, this, is a, this is a covered area here where I'm at, at outside, but I'm still going to cover the machine anyway. I don't want condensation on this thing. In fact, I may go ahead and put the lid back on just to kind of to, uh, to, to help protect it there. So we're going to let her sit and we're going to be patient. Now underneath the machine, underneath this big, big thing, there is a whole gear set. There's a whole uh, tray that I can remove to get access to the drivetrain, which is underneath. I'm not going to touch that yet. I'm going to try doing what I'm doing up here because this is where it's above that I'm seeing a lot of this uh, this uh, thick, uh, nasty, dried on grease. So I'll try that first and see how that works. I'm still, as part of the restoration, going to need to go underneath, which I do with every one of these. Take the bottom uh, tray off and get underneath and clean and lubricate. But in terms of getting the machine moving, I'm going to start here. And again, we're going to be patient. We're not going to rush. We're not going to force the machine to do something it's not ready to do yet. But we're, gonna, we're just going to hang in there and uh, we're going to see if this will make a difference. So I appreciate you guys watching this with me and uh, hopefully you'll follow along uh, in my next video installment of saving this machine. We'll see what happens. We'll see if we get any movement. There are other types of cleaners I can try, but I'll try the WD-40 first and uh, then we'll go from there. So cross your fingers, hooks, and uh, like I said, if you ever get one of these machines, uh, don't give up, don't throw it away. There may be a way to save it. We're, we're going to try with this Kenmore free arm machine. Thanks for watching, folks.